I would like to welcome everyone to the session. This is the first webinar in the CAMEX webinar series on the topic of Composites 101. Thank you all for joining. I would like to make you aware that this session will be recorded and posted on the CAMEX website for on-demand viewing. So if uh, you want to brush up on anything you might have missed in the program or share it uh, with one of your colleagues, um, this will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, if you have questions throughout the duration of the session, we do encourage you to, you, to type them into the Q&A feature um, within Zoom. So you should see that uh, available at the bottom of your screen, uh, bottom right side of the, the screen. Uh, and then um, if you can enter your questions, we will either answer them uh, if this a burning question about the content, we'll answer them during the presentation. Uh, to clarify something that might be on the slide. Uh, if there's something that can wait to the Q&A session, we'll kind of group together your comments on the Q&A session. Uh, like I said, this is quite well attended. Uh, we have uh, over 300, I guess almost 400 people registered. Um, so welcome uh, to the session today. And with that, I would like to introduce, uh, like I said, um, our colleague from SAMPI uh, and uh, Chris Locke is Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education. Um, and it says I can best describe her as a mixture of sunshine and a little hurricane. So, uh, but I will also add one thing uh, in her defense. She's also a Patriots fan, grew up in New Hampshire. So uh, welcome, Chris, uh, to the team here at CAMEX, and take it away. Thanks, Dan. Hi, I'm Chris Locke, and as Dan mentioned, I'm the Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education at the Society for the Advancement of Material and Process Engineering. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today to learn more about composites. I'm sure you'll, you've heard the news by now that CAMEX, the Composites and Advanced Material Expo, is going virtual. CAMEX is the only Composites and Advanced Materials event happening this year, so we hope you'll join us to get business done and discover the latest in the industry. As of today, you'll have the opportunity to visit over 65 exhibiting companies with more coming in each day. We also have over 100 educational sessions, live demos, interactive displays, and unique networking opportunities. But first, we have more educational opportunities for you leading up to CAMEX. Virtual tutorials take place before CAMEX on September 8th through the 10th, and two are included with each premium registration package. You can also, they can also be purchased a la carte for live or for on-demand viewing. We have six to select from with titles ranging from making a composite part from concept to reality to non-destructive inspection and evaluation for composites and bonded structures. For more information on these tutorials, click on the Educate tab at thecamex.org. This year, the featured sessions will be hosted live with dedicated time for Q&A, where attendees will have the opportunity to interact with speakers in real time. The final schedule and full slate of featured speakers from Microsoft, Uber, BFG International, Joby Aviation, Anzac Contractors, the Florida Department of Transportation, are now all available at thecamex.org. Stay tuned for more CAMEX updates by signing up for the CAMEX Connection newsletter, following us on social media, or by checking out our website at thecamex.org. Dan, back to you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and thank you for the feedback. I've already received some feedback that maybe there was a windy sound. It might be the fan here in my office in Maine. Like I said, we hit another 90 degree day here. Uh, I do not have air conditioning. So hopefully I've turned it down and that, um, that noise is not going to bother us anymore. Uh, I did fail to introduce myself. I, my name is Dan Coughlin. I'm the Vice President of Market Development for the American Composites Manufacturers Association. And we in SAMPI, ACMA and SAMPI, are partners in pulling uh, CAMEX uh, together um, as the premier uh, event for composites in North America. So thanks for attending, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, John Bussell, with 30 years of experience in composites. Uh, John has led composites industry programs 
an existing and new market development. He's very active in codes and standards development. Uh, it promotes standards through education and awareness to the industry. Um, Mr. Bussell has had a variety of positions with companies such as Brunswick Composites, Martin Marietta, and Boeing. Um, he's a fellow in the American Concrete Institute, a past chairman of 440 FRP reinforcement, and a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers, SAMPI, SPE, and ASTM. And in 2019, John was elected to the ACMA Composites Industry Hall of Fame. So congratulations to you, John. It's been just a year now uh, since you've been elected to the Hall of Fame. Congratulations. And with that, I will remind everyone, use the Q&A feature to submit your questions and comments. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to John Bussell. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thank you for uh, joining me this afternoon. Uh, we have a pretty action-packed hour, um, so uh, put your seatbelt on, strap in. Uh, we have a lot of uh, work to cover. Um, you got to love it when things uh, will work. Uh, the objectives of this session uh, will be a general understanding of FRP composite materials, information on the uses of FRP composites and the products that are associated with it, and hopefully help answer the question of why composites. So before we get started, I wanted to take a just a very brief poll uh, to find out the experience of the attendees that are attending this, uh, uh, this presentation. So if the question can be uh, teed up, um, so how many years have you been working in the composites industry? You have the choices of less than one year, between one and three years, between three and 10 years, between 10 and 20 years, and over 20 years. If you'll just take a couple of seconds to select uh, which uh, one that would be, just want to get a general sense of who's in the audience. We'll give it a couple more seconds here for people to cast their vote. And will the control room show the results of this question? So we have a pretty good even mix. I will tell you and warn you for those that are uh, experience with over 20 years when it comes to Q&A, I plan to divert the questions to you. Uh, but I'm very glad that you've joined us and uh, certainly hopefully I'll provide you with some information that you did know. So thank you very much for attending. So uh, let's uh, get started here. Oh. There we go. So the outline of my presentation, I'm gonna have five key areas, introduction, an overview of materials, manufacturing processes, applications and examples, educational and resources that you can refer to after this presentation. So what would you call a material that is stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum, more corrosion resistant than both, electrically non-conductive, a good thermal insulator, and has adjustable material properties. I would call that composites. We can make cars and trucks that are better looking and more fuel efficient. So we start off with the 1953 Corvette on the left and the 2018 Corvette on the right. Uh, everything that you see in uh, bronze there on the truck uh, is made out of composites. So think about it as you're driving down the highway. Wind turbines, uh, those wind blades um, are all made out of composites. You know, certainly the uh, wingspan of a 747, these blades are very big. Makes tanks that don't leak gasoline into our groundwater. So as you go up to your local gas station, you can see, won't well, see, but these tanks are below uh, the ground, uh, making sure that things don't leak. And we can make pipes that leak, that don't leak and corrode, deliver fresh water or take away the sewage. 
reduce pollution from industrial power plants, whether it's stack liners, scrubbers, or the various types of ducting uh, to move air through the various industrial plants. Make bridges that don't rust and extend their service life. Protect our troops with ballistic plates. Make homes more beautiful and affordable. And here you have a cast polymer uh, countertop that is showing. Make boat holes that don't rot. So here's the manufacturing of a resin infused, not a very small boat, this is a pretty big boat. Bring families closer together, so uh, uh, pools that are made in all one piece. Enables the disabled, so para-athletes, uh, the weekend warriors, and those that just want to get through day to day. Make our world more fun. This is the big blue bear outside the Denver Convention Center. So you can certainly see this uh, three-story bear made out of composites. So let's get started. What are composites? Composites is a material with two or more materials that form a new and more useful material that has properties that are superior to the individual constituents. Composites are fiber reinforced polymers or FRP. And probably during this presentation, I will interchange the uh, terminology between those two. These are engineered materials. More familiar composite materials would be reinforced concrete, which is concrete and steel, wood, which is cellulose and lignin, bone, which is collagen and apatite. So composites for this discussion is any combination of a polymer matrix and a reinforcement. So let's think composites. We are just simply another material system. They're not the only solution for all product applications because our materials provide a unique set of attributes that need to be designed carefully and suitably for the application. And obviously we should not, if we have a good composite design, we should not imitate the form and function of the existing design if composites are to offer value. So hopefully I'll give you some of the basics in order to think differently. So when we think composites, we think lightweight, which is making it easy to handle, high strength. And here I uh, throw out that composites generally are stronger than steel, many times stronger than steel. Inherently, composites are corrosion resistant, so they're durable and they have a long service life. And because of the many materials that we have, it's highly versatile. The solution we have for any project that is out there. So when we think about composites, in addition to those three, we can design composites that have superior electrical properties, thermal properties, be non-magnetic, dimensionally stable, especially in high temperature applications, parts consolidation. So how do we join a bunch of different pieces into one piece so that we can speed up the assembly time? Design flexibility. We have many materials that we can use and design from. All, all sorts of different shapes damage tolerance, radar transparency, tailoring, tailoring the type of service, whether it's rough or smooth. The inherent properties will provide long-term durability. And we can even dial in things that need to be FDA compliant. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit about materials. So what is FRP or composites? We start off with the constituents of fibers that provide the strength and the stiffness. Commonly, you will find carbon, glass, basalt, and aramid. That's combined with the polymer. A polymer protects the fibers and transfers the load between the fibers. And you'll find that it's polyester, epoxy, vinyl ester, or urethane. The fiber and the polymer together create the composite, which creates a material with superior properties than either of the constituents alone. So when we talk about composites, we have a real interesting lexicon, always identified by the type of fiber that it is, GFRP being glass fiber reinforced polymer, CFRP being carbon, BFRP with basalt, et cetera. But you'll also find in the literature search that there'll be an FRP, but it's fiber reinforced plastic. That's how some of the terminology of the composites industry first started out. 
or you might find glass reinforced plastic, GRP, and even find polymer matrix composites, PMC, they all mean the same thing. So let's dive in a little bit deeper with polymers. The critical function of a polymer is to bind the fibers together, protect the fibers from environmental attack uh, and abrasion during manufacturing, separates and disperses the fibers throughout the composites to have a uniform uh, uh, load, and transfers the force between the uh, individual fibers. So, you know, this is the front line for composites. The polymer resin is a very important component of the composite. So what is the polymer? It's an organic compound comprised of long chain molecules. There's two types, thermoplastic, which is represented by polypropylene, polyethylene, nylon, polyimide, and there's a ton of others. And then there's thermoset, and examples would be polyester, vinyl ester, epoxy, and urethane. You'll hear some of the uh, comments in some of the products talked about later. So what's the difference between a thermoset and the thermoplastic? Well, with the thermoset, it could be best, well, you can best represent the comparison with a fried egg and a candle. With a fried egg, the liquid turns to a solid when heated. But when you add more heat, it doesn't turn back to a liquid. But with the thermoplastic, the liquid turns to a solid, and when you reheat it, it will turn back to a liquid. Then you know it's a thermoplastic. So with thermoset polymers, they are chemically bonded and cross-linked when they are cured. Much like what you're seeing in the, in the uh, display right now. So once it's cross-linked, once it's fully cured, it cannot be reversed or softened. And if you do uh, elevate the temperature beyond the heat deflection temperature, there will be a deterioration that starts. So commonly used thermal set polymers, again, are unsaturated polyesters, vinyl esters, epoxy, and polyurethane. But with thermoplastic composites or thermoplastic polymers, there's extremely strong bonds within the chain mo mo molecules, but they're held together by very weak van der Waal forces. The molecules can slide past one another upon heating, but upon heating, the polymer can be reversibly softened and reshaped. So that's the nice thing about uh, thermoplastics. When you look at the industry use of comparison between thermoset and thermoplastic, the large majority of the products made in the industry are using thermoset polymers. Uh, thermoplastic polymers are increasing in recent years, uh, but I would say the lion's share uh, will always be thermoset, but there are those niche where thermoplastic is superior. So you need to understand what are the attributes of those particular products. If you talk to a resin material supplier, uh, they can certainly help you with selecting various types of uh, polymers. So, for example, if you're designing a tank which needs to have excellent corrosion resistance with a wide variety of properties because of how it's got to perform and it can process pretty easily, I would say that the selected resin would be a vinyl ester resin. But if your situation might be of high heat, and it, you need to have a very specific performance envelope, then maybe phenolic would be the better choice. This is just a general uh, table that uh, gives you the uh, uh, education of not all resins do the same things, and some have certain unique properties that are more important than others. So as you're thinking about what composites are being used and what polymers are being used, think about how it's got to perform because the selection of the resin will be very important for that. Then we have a special polymer called a gel coat. It's a specially filled resin. Its purpose is to provide a corrosion barrier with the composite laminate, provide a cosmetic appearance, and introduce color into the product. And you can see that in applications of boats, bathroom sinks, Sh uh, tubs and showers, pipe and tank applications, and building products like domes and cortices and facades. So 
looking at the other type of constituent reinforcements. There are two types. There's the fiber reinforcement and the core reinforcement. With fiber reinforcement, remember, fibers provide the strength and the stiffness. But there's various properties that you can achieve by the, depending on the type of fiber that you select. You might think about high modulus or stiffness, or high strength may be important. That would require a different fiber. The one thing that we do have between the fibers is that there's a low variation of strength between individual fibers because they're engineered. So when you design, you have a level of confidence. And certainly the way they're manufactured, they're very stable for manufacturing and handling. So they won't break or degrade uh, while, it's being manu while the product's being manufactured. And we can certainly, because it's engineered, it's a uniform diameter. And why that's important is that in design, when you're predicting the strengths and the loads, having that uniform diameter is very important. And because we can make it an unlimited length, it certainly provides a lot of opportunity to uh, make continuous manufacturing of certain products. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as we select various fibers, also need to consider cost, the availability, and the service performance ultimately of what that composite needs to do. So when we look at fibers and we take a micrograph of it, these fibers are very small. They're smaller than a human hair. The crystals and the fibers are aligned in the length, so that provides the high tensile strength. On the left-hand side is a cross-section of a fiberglass rebar. The reason why I showed this is for two reasons. One is that this sample was a fiberglass rebar that was in concrete after 15 years of being in an environment of a pH 13. And that's pretty alkaline. And you can see that there's a very good distribution of the fibers. The fibers are running in and out of the screen in a longitudinal direction. And you can see that the uh, polymer is uniformly spaced around each of those fibers. So if you were to take a slice of a fiberglass rebar, this is what you would see. And obviously, because there's no fissures, obviously it's still performing like it was first manufactured. So let's take a look at various fibers, glass fibers. It's the most commonly used fiber. It's versatile and it's inexpensive. It's being used in a lot of non-weight and modulus critical applications. It is high strength with a moderate modulus, probably about 6 million PSI. And if you compare that to steel, which is 29, you can understand that it is significantly less stiff than steel. But that's not a drawback because we would design differently. There are several grades available. E-glass, S-glass, which is more of a structural glass, AR-glass, which is alkaline or resistant, and there's many other types, ECR, C, H, um, pretty much a lot of the alphabet. So depending on what type of environment and service it needs, there's a glass variety uh, or grade uh, that would be suitable for the application. Then we have basalt fibers. Basalt fibers are made from volcanic magma. Its fiber is produced very similar to glass fiber, but in this case, we're melting the basalt rock at 1500 degrees C, and it's extruded through platinum bushings to make these thin, continuous filaments that are like hairs. Some deposits are more favorable than others, so certainly where the source of supply, this is mother nature, mind you, um, is gonna be important, and you need to pay attention to that. So as compared to glass, it's structurally slightly higher stiffer, stiffer and higher strength, but very similar to glass. It exhibits excellent thermal properties, and it was first used in aerospace applications for heat resistance. It's similar in cost to e-glass fiber, and it's cheaper than S-glass. So it's in the same family. Now as we go up the uh, stepladder a little bit, we have aramid fibers. Aramid, otherwise known as Kevlar, Kevlar is a trademark name, uh, is high tensile strength, has a moderate modulus, low density. Low compressive and shear strength, 
but we need to think about that it has very good impact strength. So think about bullets or ballistic armor. Think about uh, what uh, law enforcement uses to protect um, uh, and soldiers to protect them from uh, ballistic attack. There's two types of uh, armored fibers that are available that have different stiffnesses, and depending on what the application is, um, is the type of uh, modulus that you would uh, certainly design with. There are some durability concerns uh, with the potential for UV, UV degradation and moisture absorption, so the selection of the resin that is combined with this fiber is very important. And it's moderate to high cost as compared to glass fibers. Carbon fibers, high strength, high modulus, low density. It's very superior in its durability and fatigue characteristics, and it's used in many critical applications, and specifically where weight and stiffness or modulus is critical. There are several grades that are available. So there's the standard modulus, which is 36 to 43 million pounds per square inch, which compared to steel, which is 29, it's better than steel just from the fiber itself. There's intermediate modulus, high modulus, and ultra high modulus, which is often used in space applications where stiffness and stability um, in addition to the high strength and durability are very, very critical. But um, it is significantly higher in cost than glass. So you want to apply the fiber where it makes sense and where the properties provide value into the uh, end use product. So if we take a look at the stress strain curve, which engineers use a lot, which is a comparison of load versus deformation of fibers that are being pulled, um, like show E glass, it has linear elastic to failure. Then aramid is slightly stronger. Standard carbon is more stronger than it. High modulus carbon is strong, but uh, very stiff, so it doesn't deform as much. And ultra high modulus carbon, which doesn't deform very much, and it's very strong per pound. When you compare that with steel, which has ductility, it follows the linear elastic behavior, but then starts deforming and deflecting before it fails. So that area under the curve is very important in how you design with composites. So what are the factors that influence the design? Certainly the mechanical properties of the matrix or the polymer, as well as the fibers, but also the fiber volume fraction. The higher the volume, the higher the strength. And even the cross-sectional area, the smaller the area, the higher the strength. And most importantly is the orientation of the fibers within the polymer. Some might be random, some might be aligned. And what's really important here is the interaction between the fibers and the matrix or the bond. What I didn't tell you with all of the fibers is that there's a particular chemical treatment that's put on there that's called the sizing. And that influences the bond of these materials. But ultimately, the key factor is the method of manufacturing. And we'll get into that into the next section. So when we look at the fiber orientation, FRPs are orthotropic, meaning that the properties are directionally dependent. So with unidirectional fibers, where all the fibers are in one direction along the longitudinal axis, it is the strongest and stiffest in that direction. But transverse to those fibers or perpendicular, they're not as strong. So we need to keep that in mind. So we combat that with multi-directional FRPs and create laminates. This is where we would have the stacking of various plies or lamina, and the fibers are placed in various fiber directions or the fiber architecture, meaning 0, 90, plus 45, minus 45. So the properties can be tailored and the behavior can approach um, isotropy, which is where properties are the same in all directions. So there's various fiber reinforcement forms. There's rovings. So I show a bundle or creel of continuous roving laminates, and they may be uh, identified by multi-end and single-end. 
There's chop fibers. So just as the word chop means, these fibers are from a half an inch to an inch and a half in length, and they are randomly dispersed in resins. Uh, mats, and there are several different forms. These are rolled goods. There's chopped strand and continuous strand. So the chop fibers that you've seen are all bundled together into a rolled goods form, or it may be continuous strand, which is now taking the uh, single end rovings and arbitrarily uh, uh, scattered throughout that mat. Then there's fabrics, which is much more engineered. There's woven and non-crimped styles. We won't get into the specifics here, but I do with uh, Composites 201. Then you also have stitched, braided in 3D, or triaxial and quadraxial. And I'm just introducing you the terms because there's a whole lexicon that goes along with the composites industry. Then there's a special uh, uh, type of fabric called a veil. And it's used in a surface layer, and it supports the outer layer of resin, and it's primarily a barrier uh, that is used in corrosion applications or to prevent UV degradation in a composite. Then there's a special reinforcement called a prepreg, which is containing dry fiber that's combined with a set volume of resin that is only tacky, it's not fully cured. And then until you place it into the mold and add heat, does it take on and set and cross-link. So prepreg is a very important uh, material because you now have a pre-engineered uh, balance between fiber and resin, uh, which helps with the design. Now we also have core reinforcement. So the function of a core is to provide lightweight stiffness. It is used in sandwich construction, so for such uh, uh, products such as panels, doors, or things that have a large surface area. And you can compare it to an I-beam. So the face sheets, uh, the top and the bottom of the uh, uh, sandwich construction, act like flanges of an I-beam, which carry the stresses. The face sheets are thin, and the loads that are transferred from the face sheets go through the core, and they are translated into shear, which is equivalent to the web of an I-beam. So the purpose of an I-beam is to lessen the weight required to support a given load, but sandwich panels can substitute multiple I-beams in any structural application. There's various core reinforcements with balsa, honeycomb, and foam. I'm not gonna go through all of these here, but uh, the picture at the top with the balsa that is being used in the construction of a uh, of a boat, uh, which is normally where you would find balsa core. Honeycomb core is used in a lot of lightweight, um, high strength applications, so aerospace or high performance applications. Um, so various resins can be utilized, even fiberglass and carbon fiber, and as a uh, 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 also a lightweight and probably more economical core, thermal plastic is used. Foam core, there's both virgin varieties and recycled varieties uh, using recycled PET, uh, which is your soda bottles or water bottles. So there's different tools in the toolbox. Very important are the fillers and additives that are used, which are added to resins. So fillers are inorganic materials, and you can see the list here of Michael, mica, feldspar, talc, glass microspheres, and they have a certain performance. It reduces the shrinkage of the composites during part manufacturing. It may improve the fire resistance of laminates. It lowers the compound cost. It can influence the mechanical strengths both up and down, so depending on the type of uh, filler that you have. And it helps, and it also aids in the transfer of stresses in certain structural applications. Additives are chemicals, and primary additives are UV absorbers, flame retardants, and something that's called a low, pro low profile additive, which reduces shrinkage. They enhance the processability of the composite and extended the durability and the service performance. And even though these materials cost more in the basic composites, overall the product's cost and performance will be improved. So there's always a balance. So with that, I'm going to turn to manufacturing processes. 
So I know I'm going pretty quickly here, but there's certainly a lot to cover. One of the things that's in the composites industry is that we have many tools in the toolbox. And with manufacturing processes, they may be simple and basic or complex and sophisticated. The best process depends on the number of criteria uh, that is used. And it may be speed, it may be the size of the plant or the skill of the personnel. The one thing that the composites industry can always find is a solution. So several considerations that are out there to keep in mind. The surface complexity can influence the expense of the tool. The performance of the final product can influence the complexity of the laminate's fiber architecture. The surface appearance can influence whether secondary operations are needed after the product has been cured. And you know the balance of whether things are done by hand or by machine can be imparted by the size of the part, the production rate, the total production volume, and the economic target, which is the part cost of materials, tooling, equipment, and labor. This is what a manufacturing engineer has to think about when they are uh, selecting the right manufacturing process for the application. So there's various categories of manufacturing processes. Open molding, is where one side is a tool surface and the opposite side there is no tool surface. You know, tool engineers say if it's a tool surface, it's the money surface. What you see in the mold is what you exactly get. So if there's uh, some sort of uh, uh, defect in the mold, you will certainly transfer that into the uh, part itself. So the tool surface is the money surface. Then you have closed molding where the tool surface is on both sides. The types of manufacturing processes are common or basic and advanced. For this particular presentation, I'm only gonna focus on the common or basic processes. So let's get started. Hand layup. So if we have an open mold, this is a female mold, um, we lay a, uh, a dry fiber uh, in the mold based on whatever the design is. Uh, we mix the resin. We pour the resin into that mold and use a hand roller to saturate and blend in that resin to saturate the uh, dry fiber in that mold and let it cure at room temperature. So that's basic hand layup. This is about as simple as it gets. Uh, this is what's used mostly in the uh, uh, composites industry for most inexpensive applications. Then you have something a little bit more sophisticated, which is spray up. Again, in an open mold situation, a spray gun which dispenses resin at a predetermined rate, which is catalyzed, meaning cured, um, and it's sprayed and combined with chopped fiber, and this is sprayed onto the mold to whatever that shape may be. So if you think about the shower stall or a tub, or a small boat, or some sinks, uh, spray up is probably a more automated method uh, to distribute uh, the materials. Filament winding is a little bit more sophisticated, can be computer is computer controlled, and on the left hand side are the reels of rovings, which are then distributed through a resin bath and wound on a mandrel that is in a body of revolution, so cylinders and round things, if you will. Um, the fibers can be placed in all different directions depending on what that load is gonna be. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a wet resin bath. It could be uh, a prepreg uh, fiber uh, that is applied to the mandrel. And you would typically find this in rocket motor casings um, or uh, stack liners uh, used in industrial uh, corrosion applications. Probably the other most common uh, process is wet layup vacuum bagging. So again, we place the dry fiber in the mold, we pour the resin, saturate it out by hand, and then place a bag and pull a vacuum and allow it to cure. Now certainly if you want to advance the cure, we could put it into an oven, but this is the most basic form of open mold uh, uh, manufacturing process. The variation of that is pre-preg vacuum bagging. Again, same open mold, 
Now we're putting in a prepreg, which is now the combination of the fiber and a B stage, which is a tacky resin that's combined together. We add some breather cloth to allow vacuum to be pulled and consolidated. We've, uh, we seal it off with a vacuum bag. We pull the vacuum, and this time, because we want to densify that laminate to remove all potential areas of voids, we put it into what's called an autoclave, and that's what's in the center picture. The autoclave is a very sophisticated uh, oven and pressure device. This uh, uh, autoclave can uh, process uh, parts up to 400 degrees uh, with 100 PSI. Now, much more expensive autoclaves can go at a higher temperature and a higher pressure, and you'll find that in a lot of aerospace and high performance applications. Now, closed molding is exactly what we will have, is two tool surfaces coming together. The most typical uh, closed mold application is what's called compression molding. Here we have an upper and lower die, which is heated. Uh, we place a uh, what's called a charge, and I see the words SMC there, which is sheet molding compound in the middle of that die. And that sheet molding compound is a combination of chopped fiber and a filled resin slurry that has two uh, uh, plastic layers on either side to hold that charge together so that when the mold is closed and heated for a particular time and so the part is cured, it will then pop out uh, at the end of the cure cycle and the part is finished. Now there may be some trimming that is necessary um, uh, once the part is removed, uh, but this is a very uh, automated process used a lot in electrical applications and in, in, in the automotive industry for many of the automotive parts. Altrusion, a very uh, continuous manufacturing process much like the filament winding where you have fiber reels on one end of the process, they are, uh, fibers are, uh, are unraveled and placed into a sorting card based on the fiber architecture of that final part. It is then saturated into a resin bath and then pulled through a heated dye to produce the cured profile in a continuous manufacturing method. Now, the cured profile here is a, con a constant cross-section. And think of an I-beam, or a channel, or an angle, or a rod, things that have a constant cross-section at very long lengths. Uh, looking at this process, um, it can vary as far as the length of this uh, machine and the whole manufacturing process, anywhere from 30 to 80 feet, uh, depending on how many different uh, fabrics and fibers are being used that are being fed into the resin bath. The variation of this is resin transfer molding from compression molding, where we put dry fiber into the cavity of a mold, we close that mold, and then we inject resin until the resin pops out at the vents. The molds are heated. Um, this is providing a tooled surface on both sides, so obviously it's something that is being controlled as far as dimensions, um, as well as connecting to other parts. Variation of this is vacuum infusion processing, or VIP. It's also known as vacuum-assisted RTM. So again, we're taking a dry uh, fiber, placing it into the mold, uh, adding a, uh, uh, a plastic vacuum bag over it with channels that allow for the disbursement of the resin throughout the part. The resin is then injected under pressure and pulled with vacuum simultaneously <clears throat> so that the resin is then saturated throughout the uh, laminate, uh, and by doing such, you minimize or eliminate any voids that may occur during the manufacturing process. So,
this is a simple overview of the most basic parts that are used in our, uh, our composites industry. There are others, but time doesn't permit me to go through all of them, but suffice it to say, these are the most common. So now I'm going to go through a series of applications uh, showing various example products and the markets that they serve uh, as to what process and materials are selected for the application. So if the application is something that is lightweight and high fatigue uh, strength, probably the best known would be wind turbine blades and sucker rods that are used in the oil and gas industry. Pultruded sucker rods have been used since the early 70s and are still in performance today. It's a high strength application, uh, certainly corrosion resistance. Uh, it displaces steel, um, and this is utilizing glass fiber. Wind turbine blades, certainly lightweight. I, as I said earlier, they're very large. They're displacing uh, Sitka spruce and aluminum produced using vacuum infusion. Um, damage tolerance is very uh, important here, uh, but it utilizes a number of different materials. It's a sandwich construction, and there's laminates. It's using glass fiber and carbon fiber. Also, if you're thinking strength, here are some applications. Archery bows uh, made uh, utilizing uh, prepreg materials in a, in a multitude of closed molding applications. It may be compression molding. It may be RTM. Um, strength is very uh, big here, uh, but flexibility is very important. And the amount of uh, the selection of the materials uh, provides what sort of energy is being dissipated when you pull on that bow. Self-containing breathing apparatus, strength is a big issue here. You can see that it's filament wound, it's a cylinder. You can see fibers that are running longitudinally and through the hoop. It displaces steel, so it's a lightweight breathing apparatus. And then you have fishing rods. Fishing rods are filament wound. Flexibility is important here. Um, you will want uh, glass fiber to be utilized, and it certainly displaced steel and bamboo. Corrosion resistance. Here's probably the two most typical applications you'll ever find in the composites industry with above ground tanks and pipes. Uh, strength is very important. It displaces concrete, uh, clay, and very sophisticated stainless steels and exotic materials. Filament winding is used as well as hand layup. Um, and in some pipes, they are centrifugally cast. And I didn't talk about that, but it's probably the inverse of filament winding uh, and spray up where uh, material is sprayed to the inside of a pipe um, which is uh, then uh, extruded out at the end. Another uh, thing of corrosion resistance is boats. You don't think about it, uh, but it certainly displaced wood and aluminum. It's produced using open molding and vacuum infusion. Lightweight and parts consolidation is very important. And then we get into infrastructure applications with concrete rebar. Here is a seawall uh, that is being manufactured in uh, South Florida. Um, the Paltruded uh, rebar uh, is very important in the concrete industry. And speaking of infrastructure, uh, a number of different products that are being made, whether it's rebar, bridge decks, bridge girders, sheet piling, fender piling, pedestrian bridges, and concrete strengthening. On the left is uh, rebar bits being placed in a bridge in uh, South Kansas City. Um, then you have in the middle there a bridge deck panel panel that's being uh, placed, uh, which is uh, upgrading a bridge that was taken out of service. Uh, also in the center is a picture of sheet piling that was installed in Long Beach, Long Island, uh, which uh, was to protect uh, the community from the onslaught of the Atlantic Ocean that occurred during Superstorm Sandy. Uh, and then on the right, you see pictures of pedestrian bridge uh, and bridge girders uh, used in other infrastructure applications. If your application is lightweight, anything that flies is a certain uh, answer for the use of composites. Uh, 
displaces aluminum. Multiple processes are used um, between strength and the shapes and the damage tolerance and radar transparency. Uh, composites perform in many different applications, and it's probably better uh, exemplified by these two planes, uh, the Boeing uh, Dreamliner, the 787 on the right, and the Airbus A350 on the left, where over 50% of the aircraft utilizes uh, uh, composites, whether it be carbon fiber or fiberglass. And the reason why the commercial aircraft industry chose composites is to reduce schedule maintenance on aircraft. It's lighter, so it's going to provide better fuel economy and durable. It's not susceptible to corrosion and fatigue. So one of the things that you find that when you fly at 35,000 feet, they set the atmosphere um, in the plane anywhere from eight to 9,000 feet. Um, that tends to be a little dry and on a long flight, you certainly get fatigued. Um, with composites, they're able to drop, drop the atmospheric pressure in that plane to about 6,000, so it's introducing more humidity. And because of the corrosion resistance of composites, that's not gonna be a problem. Other high performance applications would be in racing with Formula One and NASCAR and Indy. Certainly every military aircraft out there, whether it's the, uh, uh, the body of the plane, uh, the trailing edge, uh, the, uh, uh, the tail, uh, the nose cone, um, and even the engines, uh, the blades on the fans and the cowlings all made with high performance composites that's autoclave cured. Parts consolidation. Nothing better exemplified than the front end module. Uh, this was manufactured using sheet molding compound and compression molding, and that one piece displaced 200, in excess of 200 individual stamped steel pieces that we either bolted or riveted or uh, welded together. Uh, certainly, uh, truck hood or auto body panels, um, all being made in one piece. Um, as I showed earlier in the in the slide deck, uh, that whole front engine uh, and fenders are all made in one piece. The cab is another piece, and the top of the uh, trucks are all in one piece. So it's essentially three pieces that are combined together. Electrical, very good application here. Uh, Started off with the boon truck, so both the boon and the bucket. Uh, the electrical workers standing inside the bucket are hand laid up or sprayed up using fiberglass um, and polyester resin. Uh, its corrosion resistance and strength uh, was the reason why it was selected. Then we go over to the right hand side with the poles and cross arms. Cross arms have been used in electrical utility applications for over 25 years and poles are becoming more prevalent. Uh, it's damage tolerance and corrosion resistance and strength displaces wood, steel, and concrete, and it's either made by pultrusion or filament winding. And the cable, that structural member that holds up the electrical wire, um, if you could take the weight out, you can make the wires bigger, which then can take a lot, uh, uh, a lot more electrical load um, for, uh, overhead line applications. Thermal properties, entry doors, windows, sunrooms, skylights, it's all about thermal conductivity. The CTE, or the coefficient of thermal expansion of composites matches that of glass, so that you're not gonna have that leakage and you're not gonna have that deterioration that you normally would find with PVC, wood, or even aluminum. And it's made utilizing pultrusion or through compression molding. Thermal properties, whether it's walk-in coolers or the uh, the tail end of some of those trucks called reefers, um, uh, keeping uh, something very insulated from the temperature outside and keeping things cool. Um, hog slats, you don't ever think about it, but you know between the corrosion resistance used in that low bacterial growth uh, that won't uh, persist, um, as well as the heat. Uh, that comes from uh, those environments, uh, certainly displaces wood and concrete that would deteriorate over time. Flexibility. You know, we see this in the Olympics all the time between vault poles and the uneven parallel bars, 
Those bars are made using pultrusion and it displaces wood. Obviously, the flexibility and strength and damage tolerance is key. Not to be outdone by highway delineators, so hopefully you're not hitting those as you're separating certain lanes of traffic. Displaces wood and aluminum. And leaf springs that you're finding more and more in trucks and automotive applications utilizing fiberglass that outperforms steel and its durability is certainly superior uh, to steel. So we're going to see a lot more of that in automotive applications and probably more so in the electric vehicles. And it could be very simple as to looking to your garage and looking at tool handles, uh, displacing wood and aluminum, these poltruded uh, uh, profiles, which are solid rods or tubes, uh, or utilized in these uh, tool handles. Damage tolerance, uh, whether it's signs or up armored Humvees, or certainly aircraft that are in military zones, uh, ballistic and blast protection uh, is a superior uh, advantage as compared to other materials that could be selected. Radar transparent, you know, there's a lot of things that you could see, and uh, whether it's a steeple on a church that may have antennas um, or other. Uh, modules inside to uh, produce uh, electrical uh, uh, sound waves, or whether it's a radome that's utilized in aircraft, uh, the superior uh, performance of composites in transmitting uh, radar waves are very important. Sporting goods, we see it all the time, whether it's hockey sticks, golf clubs, or tennis rackets, we've seen the evolution of these products where professional athletes are looking at, and even the common uh, duffer on the weekend is looking for that edge. Carbon fiber is primarily used here in those applications. And then you have unique shapes. You know, I talked about the three-story blue bear that's on the outside of the Denver Convention Center, but certainly anything that you see colorful on the outside of buildings most likely are made from composites. And then I wanted to show this uh, in an aerospace application, both the launch vehicle and Spaceship One, utilizing materials that you would find in common everyday uh, applications. Uh, you'd be surprised that you know materials that have been used in uh, tubs and showers, uh, as well as uh, panels uh, for entry doors, can also fly in space. And this was, Bert Rutan showed uh, very uniquely um, how to utilize these materials in very aggressive applications of space. So I wanted to share with you some other additional educational resources that you could also uh, tap into outside of this presentation. Starting off with the Young, uh, the Composites Merit Badge, and I show this because that particular pamphlet is a very good basic guide to composite materials and introduces uh, our young into the basic concepts of open molding and uh, saturating resins with fibers. And uh, it's a very good tool um, for most anybody that want to learn composites. Then more online, we have compositeslab.com, which is an excellent resource of information that I've shown in this presentation, as well as additional information. So check out compositeslab.com. Looking at the end use applications, uh, take a look at discovercomposites.com. Here are the applications in the various market segments to learn more about how composites have been utilized. And then if you want to get trained, ACMA has a certified comp uh, composites technician program that's nationally recognized that provides the skills and the talent necessary to perform better open molding, vacuum infusion process, and all of the processes that are listed here. Uh, you can find that information at acmet.org on certified composites technician. And then there's the ACMA educational hub. Uh, which is uh, certified uh, technician training, 
codes and standards, uh, webinars and other technical materials to advance uh, your knowledge in composites. And certainly attending CAMEX, and of course we're doing that virtual this year, but when we do get the chance to meet each other face-to-face, -face, uh, reading technical papers, attending the educational sessions uh, in the exhibit hall, they will have the demo zone, excellent opportunities to learn about composites. But don't forget about the industry magazines and newsletters, whether it's Composites Manufacturing, Sampy Journal, or Composites World, all delivering timely information about composites that is being used today. Never ignore the material suppliers and distributors on their websites providing material data and the applications in which their products are being used. Or even the product manufacturers, because they'll focus more on the end use products and the market applications. And as we look at evolution and innovation, the university programs, and I list three here, there are many others, whether it's University of Delaware, University of Maine, or West Virginia University, they're doing cutting edge technology of applying materials and products to advance them into um, applications. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the composites industry uh, for their pictures and information that were utilized in this presentation. And uh, I'm open to questions right now, Dan. Well, thank you so much, John. And uh, we had, do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for asking your questions. Uh, please use the Q&A feature if you have any additional questions. Um, so uh, we have seen the growth of composites in a number of different areas. Um, can you comment on, you've touched on thermoplastics um, being a smaller portion. Can you touch on where there are some growth areas in thermoplastic composites? Well, the growth areas that I see in thermoplastic composites are high performance applications, uh, specifically in aerospace. And there's an evolving market called urban air mobility, where it's a opportunity for the composites industry to marry the materials with the sophistication and performance of aerospace with the production rate of automotive uh, pulling it together. Um, I think part of thermoplastics is that it's not necessarily thoroughly understood, uh, specifically in how to design with it. Uh, you know, the industry was born with thermoset composites. So I think it's a matter of education, even within our own industry, to open up those opportunities. Thanks, John. Um, we had a couple of questions come up in regards to UV resistance. And uh, so one of the questions had to do with, is it necessary to use UV additive for the entire volume of the resin being used, or can it be applied just in the outer layer? Um, actually, uh, both. So if uh, you, you know, UV absorbers can be added to the resin, if a laminate is being created and being inserted um, into the environment. Um, I talk about the gel coat, which is an exterior surface, um, and that gel coat can have UV protection built into that. So if you think about the open mold application, uh, the first step is to apply uh, a 15 to 20 mil layer of gel coat uh, which is then that UV barrier, and then the laminate is then placed on top of it. So it can be done in both ways. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, getting back to slides 53 and 54 in the presentation where you talk about vacuum bagging, um, the comment came up around the process of bleeding the vacuum bag. You just want to comment on that for a second? Yes, so it's very important um, to when you are uh, taking a bag and covering up uh, the dry fiber with the resin, you're also entrapping air. And when you're entrapping air, you're creating voids. And the best way to get rid of those voids, which a void is a bad thing in the composites lexicon, because that introduces an area for damage 
and for de uh, delamination. So there are certain fabrics, uh, there are certain uh, components where it allows, much like if you think of felt, uh, felt is a very bulky layer that has a lot of uh, uh, avenues uh, or paths for air to flow out. What you want to try to do in vacuum uh, is to bleed out all of that air, to uh, consolidate the laminate and reduce the amount of voids that are in the laminate. And vacuum can only do so much. Uh, putting it in an autoclave uh, uh, puts even more pressure in addition to the vacuum uh, to remove out the voids that uh, eliminates any sort of deterioration uh, or failure that may be in that composite. Thanks, John. Um, around the reinforcement and resin combinations, you talked about a number of different uh, reinforcement fibers and resins. Are there combinations that are not compatible in terms of the reinforcement fibers with certain resins? Well, um, yes and no. I think uh, if you remember the one component that I said that the bond between the fiber and the resin is very important. And there's a special uh, chemical that is applied to the fiber that's called sizing uh, that allows for or enhances the bond uh, to the resin. And that chemistry has to be tailored to the type of resin that are that you're being used, so that I know that in the uh, area in which I was working in manufacturing, epoxy and carbon fiber work very well together because the sizing that's applied to the carbon fiber is perfect for epoxy, but the sizing was not necessarily chemically balanced for the use of vinyl ester. That's since been changed. So it really comes back down to when you're selecting your fiber and working with the uh, uh, fiber material supplier, it's really important for them to know the resin that is being used to make sure that they have the appropriate uh, bonding chemical that is with that fiber. Thank you. Um, question came up in regards to um, release aids uh, for composites in R, PTFE, synthetic fluoropolymer, or Teflon uh, coatings normally used as release aids? So I didn't touch on anything, and that's more of a tooling issue, uh, which will most likely get brought up in next week's uh, uh, presentation on Tooling 101. Um, depending on the type of product that you're making, uh, there's a number of different release agents that can be used, which would be influenced by the type of tool that is being used, as well as the materials that are being formed on that tool, as well as the processing temperature. Uh, sometimes if you utilize a Teflon type material, it can then get imparted on the final composite product. And if you're trying to bond that composite to another composite, you've now put a barrier where you cannot bond. So selection of the release agents is very important uh, as to what the product is going to be done after it is formed and cured. All right. Um, so, uh, and I know we can talk at length on this topic, but maybe if you could give a quick reply uh, I think it is a common request. Can you comment on the recycling of scrap carbon fiber and the status of recycling technologies for the scrap carbon fiber? So recycling scrap carbon fiber is an evolving uh, topic. Um, the technologies to recycle uh, composites there. I did not touch at all about recycling in this particular presentation, but there are a number of uh, mechanisms to recycle fiber. Uh, there are good ones and bad ones. 
Um, and it really comes back down to how much of the composite is being then reused and more importantly, the function of the fiber and how the fiber is going to contribute to the mechanical performance of that new application. So you want to provide uh, and preserve uh, the fiber as much as possible so that you can retain as much of the strength of that fiber as possible. And where they're applied, uh, there are markets that are being worked on as we speak and it really comes back down to a couple of functions, both in the supply end of the business, as well as what the ultimate performance of that end use product is gonna be. So we can see use of recycled uh, composites uh, being used in tables and outside furniture, to railroad ties, to other uh, less structural applications, so that's still an evolving thing. And Dan, I know you're involved with recycling as well. And certainly the technology is evolving. One of the challenges that we have is that the value of carbon fiber needs to be preserved, but we have a large volume of glass fiber that's already out there in the industry. And in only certain markets are some of these products actually seeing the end of life. And that's part of the supply chain issue of when do our composites see the end of life and when do we get to recycle them? Yeah, maybe I would leave that topic because it's, it's an extensive one with the comment that carbon fiber recycling is a nascent industry in the United States and, and globally. Um, but I think in the US it's more market driven and carbon fiber has a higher residual value in terms of market value. Europe and other parts of the world is more driven by regulatory forces and there they've done more work in glass fiber recycling. And I know uh, uh, we have shared information across the world to kind of bring the best uh, technologies together, the best information um, around this topic. So um, we can definitely you know, talk more on this topic uh, later on. Um, Absolutely. So uh, other questions that have come in. Um, can you talk about in terms of, you know, scaling up the use of composites? You know, one of the factors obviously that gets into the equation is the cost uh, of implementing composites in certain applications and enabling broader commercial use. Uh, do you want to comment just a bit about um, ways to reduce costs and enable broader use of composites? Well, reducing cost is a complicated uh, answer. Part of it is selecting the right materials, and part of it is selecting the right technology uh, for implementation. Uh, the manufacturing process is a very important component in all of that. And that one slide that I sh showed as to whether you do things via hand or via machine, um, obviously it would be great from a repeatable standpoint uh, that more automation that is used, the better the product. But you know, I come to the adage of if I'm giving a bucket of resin and some dry fiber, and I have five different technicians that are gonna make a product with the same starting materials, depending on their training, depending on their attention to detail, I could have five different uh, uh, products that come out of it and perform differently. So training is important, consistency is important uh, as far as how the materials are provided and introduced into the manufacturing process. And certainly the selection of the right manufacturing process makes all of the difference. Uh, if you have a good manufacturing engineer and a good tooling engineer, uh, and that was both, uh, you can make good decisions and bad decisions. So uh, it, I could certainly talk 
uh, offline uh, with more detail, but it's it's complicated. Yeah, the thing that I would add there, John, I think that we have heard is that if you think about designing with composites from the ground up, that's your greatest opportunity to reduce costs, reduce part count, part consolidation, uh, serving multiple functions with the same composite part. Um, one of the best, one of the best uh, examples is sort of this material right here. I don't know if people can see that on your screen, but there's a fiberglass top and bottom layer, basalt in the middle. This is the floor of a cab of a semi, and it replaced 50 pieces of metal. One continuous product replaced 50 pieces of metal, noise, vibration, harshness, support, all in this one function. And if so, if you look at the cost per pound of material, certainly it's higher for that sandwich, but in terms of the overall application, it's very competitive uh, with other materials. So um, that's another way to think of getting the best value out of composites. Exactly, and I made that point very early on that if we're just taking composites and replacing whatever it is replacing to, to look like, smell like, taste like, we're not taking full advantage of the value of the composite product. We saw this in the late 90s uh, when we were developing bridge decks and utilizing composites. And obviously the civil engineer and contractors were very used to using I-beams and channel sections to build um, you know, these bridge decks. And we were introducing something that had a hexagonal shape to it. And you know, the resistance that the end user had to that shape was because they didn't fully understand it. But we optimized the performance of the transfer of stresses from the top to the bottom layer. And that proved to be a game changer on the overall performance of that application. So we have to think of how do we provide value and not just substitute. Okay. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in. We'll try to get back to as many as we, we can uh, in this webinar. Uh, we will try to get back to those uh, in writing, to those we don't get to, the questions we don't get to. So um, thank you for submitting all your questions. Um, so question came in around the um, recycling of fiberglass protruded rails for instance, from ladders. Um, and um, maybe, um, maybe uh, John, do you wanna take a, a quick shot at that one? So were they asking how would one recycle protruded, ra uh, protruded glass rails? Yes, like a ladder rail. So one of the things that you wanna to try to preserve here is what would be the in use application that I would go in and obviously grinding the uh, product up into something that can be uh, repurposed into a different application is gonna be important. We're not too worried about the strength of the glass fiber uh, once it is ground up. So uh, grinding is probably the most economical. Uh, certainly we can use pyrolysis or sulvolysis which is using a solution or heat uh, to break down that composite. And a lot of it depends on the type of uh, uh, resin that has been utilized, but I would suspect that uh, grinding would be the best option for that. Okay. Um, so when you vacuum an oven cure apart, is there a potential to take out too much resin um, and how, much resin should bleed from a pre-preg polyimid, for example? Well, um, that is the science of vacuum infusion. And uh, part of that is a balance between the viscosity of the resin, the pathways that you create uh, underneath the bag or those little uh, boulevards and avenues of uh, uh, resin that can get moved. One of the things that, and, and it also goes to the, the sizing 
that is on the fibers that are utilized in the laminate, it has the potential to potentially, depending on how fast the resin cures, that there might be some areas that do get, become dry, uh, but it's not necessarily a situation that will prevent uh, ultimate use. You'll never have a situation, and I've never seen it, uh, where uh, the bleeding of the air out underneath the bag is going to cause any sort of deterioration in the uh, uh, dispersion of the resin, uh, but it is a combination of what the viscosity is, uh, the pathways, and most importantly, the contour of the part itself. Um, that's very important. Uh, it's one thing when you're having something that is very gentle and smooth versus something that might have a hard corner where it's changing uh, to a 90 degree angle. So. Uh, again, it comes back down to skill and knowing how to place those uh, bleeder tubes. All right. Well, we have so many more questions. We will try to get back to folks. Uh, really appreciate it. We've gone over a bit. Um, this was scheduled to end at 2.15. I want to thank our producer, Brianna Condon, out there at Sampy uh, in California, and Chris Locke, uh, our partners in Camex. Uh, for the webinar today. Um, thank you all for participating in this session. If you have additional questions, feel free to fill out the contact form on the CAMEX website and CAMEX will follow up. Make sure to register for CAMEX 2020 virtual to learn about the sessions. Now you'll receive an email with a 10% discount for the CAMEX virtual event. I know we've had a question in regards to, will there be the opportunity to network? and make contacts, absolutely there will be. Um, we'll have extensive opportunity for networking, uh, making connections, asking questions, finding partners up and down the supply chain. So definitely that will be a big part of CAMEX this year. Uh, we expect to have an expanded uh, audience uh, participation uh, for CAMEX in terms of our reach because of the virtual event. We look forward to seeing you all there. And thank you so much for attending this webinar. Um, appreciate your attendance and uh, please tune in for the future webinars, Tooling 101. Uh, John will be doing another program in 201. So uh, some of the questions we weren't able to get to here, hopefully we can do in 201. And there will be Manufacturing 4.0, Factory of the Future uh, webinar coming up. Thanks everyone, have a great day and uh, we'll see you in a future uh, CAMEX event. Thank you.